Hi friends, I'm going to do something a little bit different today for the sermon time. I'm going to start with a little video I put together of me painting a picture while I chat. For those of us who are a bit older, you might remember Bob Ross, who used to host a television program called The Joy of Painting on PBS. So you can use your imagination and think of me as the Bob Ross of Anik without the hair. After the video, I'm going to close by sharing a few words from Psalm 107. So here we go. Well, hi friends. Uh, welcome to Pastor Paul's uh, office uh, slash studio slash creative hub. Um, and what I'd like to do today is simply paint. And uh, I'll show you what I'm working on now. I'm working on a ocean painting. This is a four foot by four foot um, acrylic painting that I've been working on for some time now. And uh, what I'd like to do is simply work on it. And as a backdrop to that, I'm going to share with you uh, some uh, uh, some thoughts from the scriptures uh, concerning the sea. Um, so let's go. I love the ocean. Uh, I like to look at it, sail on it, uh, swim in it, even smell and taste its saltiness. And I, I like to paint it, or at least uh, attempt to, to paint it. Uh, it's one of the wonders of God's good creation. The sea is absolutely beautiful, uh, vast, powerful. However, according to Revelations chapter 21, in the new creation, the new heaven and the earth, it tells us that there will be no more sea. Revelations 21.1 Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared and the sea was also gone. Well, that's a bit of a surprise and a disappointment, isn't it? But as always, we need to look at the fuller biblical picture to understand what Revelation chapter 21, 1 means. We know that in the very beginning, in the creation account, in the book of Genesis chapter 1, the sea appears, then the formation of dry land, and the sea creatures and the animals all come forth. And the pinnacle of God's creation, human beings. And then it says, Then God looked over all he had made, and he saw that it was very good. But sadly, as a result of the fall, in Genesis chapter 3, things quickly fall apart. By Genesis chapter 6, with the story of Noah and the great flood, the rising waters pose a deadly threat to the entire world that God had created. Of course, God saves Noah and his family and a host of animals by his sheer grace, by instructing Noah to build an ark. It's a theme that is often repeated in the Bible. God coming to the rescue, pointing ahead, of course, to the greatest saving act when Jesus willingly lays down his life on the cross. Meanwhile, in the story of Noah and the flood, it seems that from the very good creation, the sea, is in some ways enacting God's judgment upon sinful humanity. Now, we don't hear much about the sea until the book of Exodus. And remember, God had heard the cries of his enslaved people in Egypt. He sends Moses to lead them from freedom. And soon, into the rescue, Moses and the Israelites find themselves trapped between the pursuing Egyptian army and the impassable sea in front of them. Well, you know the story. God makes a way through for them to rescue his people, 
and once more to impose his righteous judgment against those who oppose the will of God. The sea literally covers the Egyptian army. Psalm 77, verse 16. When the Red Sea saw you, O God, its waters looked and trembled. The sea quaked to its very depths. Another foretaste of the work of Jesus, rescuing us from slavery and death, and making a way forward into the promised land, the new creation. And often in the Gospels, there's a parallel between Jesus' story and the Exodus account. The Psalms have many references to the sea, often in relationship to the sea's great power. However, in Psalm 29, it says this, verses 3 and 4. The voice of the Lord echoes above the sea. The God of glory thunders. The Lord thunders over the mighty sea. The voice of the Lord is powerful. The voice of the Lord is majestic. Then it says in verse 10, The Lord rules over the floodwaters. The Lord reigns as king forever. In other words, God our King is mightier than the sea. In fact, Psalm 33 verse 7 tells us that the Lord assigned the sea its boundaries and locked the oceans in vast reservoirs. The Lord, of course, is above the sea. Listen to the beginning of Psalm 69 where the sea is used as a metaphor of being in trouble. Psalm 69, verse 1. Save me, O God, for the floodwaters are up to my neck. Deeper and deeper I sink into the mire. I can't find a foothold. I'm in deep water, and the floods overwhelm me. I'm exhausted from crying for help. My throat is parched. My eyes are swollen with weeping, waiting for my God to help me. Sometimes in life it seems that we are in it, so to speak, way over our heads. But it gets worse. The Bible uses the image of the sea to paint an even darker picture. In Daniel chapter 7, verse 2, it says this, In my vision that night, I, Daniel, saw a great storm churning the surface of a great sea, with strong winds blowing from every direction. Then four huge beasts came up out of the water, each different from the others. These sea monsters, if you will, are waging war against the people of God. And so the sea, that Genesis chapter 1 portrays as something good that God has made, has now become a threat. Now, the Jewish people in ancient times were not known as a seafaring people. The sea came to represent the forces of evil and death, a dark power that might overwhelm you, just like the story of Noah and the flood. Or think of the storm at sea in the story of Jonah. Jonah's rebellion and disobedience was responsible for the storm. Now, there's a point that I want to make through this, pardon the pun, seafaring journey. Wouldn't you agree that the current situation in our world seems like we're floating in a stormy sea, a global pandemic? The threat of illness and perhaps even death lurk all around in the form of a microscopic virus. There's panic, there's fear in some quarters, we just don't know how this will end. And sometimes, of course, when you let your imagination get the best of you, it feels like the floodwaters are rising. Psalm 69, deeper and deeper, I sink into the mire. I can't find a foothold. I'm in deep water and the flood overwhelms me. Now, to those listening, you might feel a little overwhelmed. But we need to remember, friends, that we, of course, are a people of hope. We believe 
in an all-powerful creator God who will one day make a new creation in which the dark and threatening sea of chaos, evil and death, will be no more. Revelation 21.1, Then I saw a new heaven, a new earth, for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared, and the sea was also gone. There has to be hope. Just like the sign of the rainbow after Noah's flood. Yes, the sea is powerful, but our Lord God is more powerful still. we got to remember that. Amen? Amen. So let's trust him together as I pray. And this is from Psalm 107. Some went off to sea in ships, plying the trade routes of the world. They too observed the Lord's power in action, his impressive works on the deepest seas. He spoke and the winds rose, stirring up the waves. Their ships were tossed to the heavens and plunged again to the depths. The sailors cringed in terror. They reeled and staggered. They were at their wit's end. Lord, help, they cried in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He calmed the storm to a whisper and stilled the waves. What a blessing was that stillness as he brought them safely into harbor. Let them praise the Lord for his great love and for the wonderful things he has done for them. Let them exalt him publicly before the congregation and before the leaders of the nation. Psalm 107, verses 29 and 30 again. Lord, help, they cried in their trouble, and he saved them from their distress. He calmed the storm to a whisper and stilled the waves. What a blessing was that stillness as he brought them safely into harbor. Perhaps you're one of those people who feel like you are in a storm right now. The waves are rising. The storm is overwhelming you. So you cry out, Lord help. Now, I know that you know this, but I'll say it anyway. The Lord is with you. The Lord loves you. The Lord will never leave or abandon you. Now, I encourage you to take some time this coming week and slowly make your way through Psalm 107, which I read a portion of. Psalm 107 speaks into all kinds of situations that we might find ourselves in. There are people lost and perishing in wide open spaces. In contrast to this, there are those locked up in prison in closed spaces. There are people who are sick and there are people who are lost at sea. This might describe something that you're dealing with right now. How God answers our prayer is totally up to him. But we are to cry out. How do we get this assurance in the midst of our suffering? How can we be sure that no matter what it looks like to the world, we are loved and accepted by the only eyes that really matter? How can we trust God's grace even when it hurts and it's scary in the storm. We need to know that Jesus Christ bowed his head into the greatest storm, the storm of God's righteous divine judgment on the cross for you and for me. As we are, are reminded of the Lord's great sacrifice, I pray that you will hear the voice of love from God our Father in heaven. Psalm 107 tells us that the lost are eventually found, the prisoner is set free, the sick are healed, and those tossed on a rough sea are brought safely into harbor. Jesus on the cross dies, seemingly lost, 
for three days, and yet on the third day rises so that we who are lost can be found forever. Jesus on the cross dies, is locked in the prison of the dead for three days, and yet on the third day rises to new life and freedom so that those who are in prison in their sin or shame or guilt can be free. Jesus on the cross suffers, and it is through his wounds that we are healed. Jesus on the cross takes on all the forces of evil, darkness, and chaos, so that we can be assured of coming to that place in his forever kingdom where we will be safe and sound, a safe haven. If you are going through a time of suffering where there doesn't seem to be any relief, if you feel absolutely alone, you need to know that because the Lord Jesus bore your sin and mine on the cross, he will be with you. You can know that you're walking the same path that Jesus walked on of suffering so that you're not alone or ever will be alone because the path you're on right now ultimately will take you to the Lord Jesus himself. Let's pray. Father, I pray for my dear friends gathered today. Lord, wherever we are at, we want to trust you. If we're in that dark place, that frightening place, we say, Lord, help. Father, in your great compassion, I pray that right now you would give each person a sense of your hope and a sense of your abiding presence with them forever. And I ask all of this in the strong name of Jesus Christ, the Lord. Amen.